Hello, BookTube. Uh, since the last video, it feels as though the situation has markedly deteriorated. Um, thankfully, I'm still healthy and my immediate family is still healthy, which of course is uh, the most important thing. But the, the level of anxiety has really gone up. I now know a lot of people who are sick. Some uh, have been very sick. Last night, I was watching a television show with my wife after the kids were finally asleep and it was like sort of a nice respite and I was thinking to myself the whole time uh, this is like such a dumb silly show but it's like distracting and diverting and it made me think about an essay that I read a while back called uh, The Imagination of Disaster by Susan Sontag and I'm going to grab it one second I actually uh, printed out the essay just for this video, right here, The Imagina Imagination of Disaster, copyright 1965. The essay opens as follows, quote, ours is indeed an age of extremity, for we live under continual threat of two equally fearful but seemingly opposed destinies, unremitting banality and inconceivable terror. End quote. And that's what I was feeling last night. I was feeling I'm so anxious about what's going on in the world and about the future. And this television show, which I'm using as a distraction, is so incredibly banal. And these are like the two poles of existence. And there's an interplay between them because we use, you know, maybe one to distract us from the other. So she wrote this essay, and it's an essay about... Uh, science fiction movies, basically. Um, since it was written in 1965, it was before uh, modern superhero movies. But I think when I read this essay, I just think of modern superhero movies. So I thought I would make an original tag video for the Age of Extremity tag. Just some questions uh, that this essay provoked. So question number one is, what is your favorite book or movie that deals with catastrophe or the imagination of disaster and this this genre this genre of science fiction of uh, superhero movies is, is something I'm not really I don't really enjoy I don't really consume a lot of um, so for me uh, what comes to mind is is maybe melancholia by Lars von Trier question number two is what is a book or a movie or a piece of art that deals with anxiety or maybe expresses anxiety. And, and I struggled with this one. I couldn't really think of any books that really deal with anxiety. Um, David Grossman's To the End of the Earth describes in, in really amazing artistic detail the anxiety of a mother whose son goes to war. But yeah, I, I struggled with this question. Uh, outside of literature there's sort of other mediums that speak to anxiety uh, for me in a very direct way uh, so for example um, music the artist Shushu spelled X-I-U-X-I-U -X -I -U, is uh, one of my favorite artists and I think a lot of their music uh, captures kind of a really profound sense of like anxiety and sort of Something disturbed, something very disturbed about that music. Uh, so one example of that is a cover of a Nina Simone song that they do. Uh, they have an album of Nina Simone covers, which is an album that I really like. It's called Nina, and the song like Don't Smoke in Bed is just a very anxiety-producing, anxiety-capturing kind of song. Uh, a lot of the music of Julius Eastman, he's like a modern minimalist composer, also uh, really captures a sense of anxiety for me. Next question, what is a piece of art that speaks to a sense of boredom or a sense of ennui, a sort of alienation from the world? And so uh, the book that comes to mind for me is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. There's like a, a strong sense of numbness in that book, a sort of detachment from the world. The next question is more of a personal question, and it's sort of how do you, do you experience and if so, what do you do with the experience of boredom?
or ennui. Uh, I guess it's a big luxury <laughs> to be able to experience that if, if um, things are not going well in your life and if you're very poor, uh, it might not be uh, an experience you have the luxury of having. But uh, it's something that I personally experience. And I think a lot about the opening lines of Moby Dick. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my hypos get such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I count it high time to get to see as soon as I can, end quote. And so for me, uh, the answer to the question is sports. I use sports as sort of an outlet for uh, a kind of sense of purposelessness that I might feel from time to time. Next question. In the essay, The Imagination of Disaster, Susan Sontag is sort of making the argument that these movies, these science fiction movies, are dealing with a kind of trauma that we have as a society, this trauma around nuclear weapons, this trauma around the risks associated with disaster, these existential risks, planetary risks. And so my next question is, what is a book that deals with trauma, the theme of trauma? Toni Morrison's uh, Sula, I think, would be a good example of that for me. Next question. In the essay, one of the major themes that Susan Sontag picks up upon in this genre of science fiction, and I would say also uh, in the genre of superhero movies, is this theme of dehumanization. She seems to be arguing that at the heart, at the core of these books, is this question, this theme of dehumanization. Quote, another kind of satisfaction these films supply is extreme moral simplification. That is to say, a morally acceptable fantasy where one can give outlet to cruel or at least amoral feelings. The sense of superiority over the freak, conjoined in varying proportions with the, tin with the titillation of fear and aversion, makes it possible for moral scruples to be lifted, for cruelty to be enjoyed. They provide a fantasy target for righteous bellicosity to discharge itself and for the aesthetic enjoyment of suffering and disaster, end quote. And she goes on to talk about later in the essay how one of the big fears and one of the big threats that the alien intruder often poses in these narratives is the threat of dehumanizing you, of turning you into a kind of robot, of turning you into a kind of automaton. So there's this big central question of dehumanization at the center of these works. And so the next question is, what is a work of art or a book that deals with this theme of dehumanization. And so uh, in the context of performance art, uh, I think of two very famous pieces of performance art, which I consider to be very haunting on this topic. And one is Cut Piece by Yoko Ono, and the other is Rhythm Zero by Maria Abramovich. And they're, they're both similar in a way, slightly different setups. Uh, Yoko Ono sits on a stage wearing clothing, and she invites members of the audience to come up and to cut uh, pieces of her clothing off. And Maria Abramovich is in a room and she uh, has sort of this instruction to viewers in this room that she is an object. And she's in a room with, filled with objects, all sorts of objects, rose, whatever, honey, who knows what, like 70 something objects, including a loaded gun. And she says, you can do whatever you want with me. I'm just an object. And it is a haunting exhibit. Um, it's an opportunity for people to become cruel. It's an opportunity for people to really dehumanize these artists in a very disturbing kind of way. And the results are sort of unsurprising. It's a kind of real life Milgram experiment. We get a chance to see the, the dark side. What do people do when they're given this invitation to dehumanize, to abase, to embarrass someone? And in both cases, uh, I, f I feel like the behaviors that are manifest are, are, are really disturbing. Beyond that, there's a book that I love by Israeli playwright Hanoch Levin. Um, so this is a book of plays, and, and I love this, this book of plays. And uh, they, they deal with these themes. 
And it's, it, he provides, Hanukkah Levine provides a vision of humanity, which is very, very bleak and very cruel. He has a play called The Torments of Job, and it has a scene which uh, is very memorable to me. And it's a sort of a modern retelling of the torments of Job. And so you have this character who, of course, starts off very, very wealthy. And, of course, he loses everything. And there's a scene when the uh, government like tax collectors come to him to repossess all his belongings. And so a team of tax collectors are pulling everything out of his house, all his clothing, all his belongings. They're just shipping everything off stage. And Job is uh, sitting passively as he's losing everything, all his material belongings. And they take his clothing off him. And so now he's sitting naked. And they take all the belongings out of the room. And so he has nothing and he's sitting naked. And the tax collectors are off stage except for one. And as like a taunt, as a way to sort of bite back at one of these tax collectors, Job says, "Uh, excuse me, sir, you missed something. I have some gold teeth in my mouth and this tax collector is very offended that Job would say this to him and he says excuse me sir I am just a person a human being I have a family to go home to I'm just doing my job okay this is not personal so don't take it personally I just have family to go home to I'm just doing my job okay sir and he like marches off stage and then there's like this long pause where Job is sitting now on an empty stage completely naked and after a while that same tax collector runs back on stage with a pair of pliers and he pries open job's mouth and he starts digging in his mouth pulling out teeth so the last question towards the end she writes susan sontag writes as follows quote there is absolutely no social criticism of even the most implicit kind in science fiction films. No criticism, for example, of the conditions of our society which create the impersonality and dehumanization which science fiction fantasies displace onto the influence of an alien it. Also, the notion of science as a social activity interlocking with social and political interests is unacknowledged. End quote. And she goes on to talk about this as popular forms of entertainment, like these science fiction films that she's analyzing and criticizing, are morally very dull. There's no criticism. There's nothing challenging in these texts. And so the last question is, what are some books or some authors or some pieces of art that do have that power, you think, uh, that for you maybe do make you think twice about the status quo. And for me, what comes to mind is a lot of uh, writing from Israeli Israeli writers. Uh, David Grossman, for example, I mentioned earlier, where they have the power, good Israeli writers, I think, to make visible a lot of the violence and a lot of the oppression which is invisible by default and uh, they have the capacity to put you in the mind of people and convey the experience of people that are otherwise invisible in sort of mainstream society and so to me those those come to mind so I'll stop there Um, that's the tag I'll tag a few small number of people um, who may not even see this video, and that's totally fine. Um, but just a few people that, that I, whose content I really enjoy. Um, so Steve Donahue, uh, of course, whose videos I watch religiously. Jason Harrigan at Byways and Booklands, whose videos I always, uh, always enjoy. And um, Brian at Bookish. And I'd be really interested also to hear Kathy over at The Grim Reader. Uh, she's someone who I think I have a lot in common in terms of reading interests. And she's someone who, in a few different instances, has really guided my reading. Um, I bought a really amazing book 
because I saw it on her bookshelf in one of her videos. She directed me to the writings of Angela Carter, which I've been really enjoying recently. And so, Kathy, the Grim Reader, I'll tag you as well. Um, and I'll also tag uh, another booktuber uh, who I enjoy, Lukash, at Totally Pretentious. Um, so just a few of the content producers that I enjoy, I've tagged. Uh, thanks for watching.